All right, grab your Bibles and turn with me to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1, and then we're going to flip to 2 Kings 23. I'll read those texts. We are starting our State of the Church series today, a two-week series, and I want to start with the concept of Reformation. So Joshua chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. And then we'll flip to 2 Kings shortly thereafter. All right, Joshua chapter 1, verses 8 through 9. These are the words of God. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way successful, and then you will be prosperous. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be in dread or be dismayed, for Yahweh your God is with you wherever you go. And then flip to 2 Kings chapter 23, just a a little bit away from Joshua. Second Kings 23, verse 1, these are the words of God. Then the king sent, and they gathered to him all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up to the house of Yahweh, and all the men of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him. And the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great, and he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of Yahweh. Then the king stood by the pillar and cut a covenant before Yahweh, to walk after Yahweh and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to establish the words of this covenant that were written in this book and all the people entered into the covenant. Let's pray. Our Father and God, we have come together on this first Lord's Day of 2022 to tithe our time away and hope that you would meet us here. Father, we know that you are present with us every day for you have given us your Holy Spirit. But since your Spirit has brought us into the head, who is Christ our Lord, we ask together that you would, as we're here, refresh us from, our, uh, from your eternal fountainhead of grace. Lord, we ask now as we look to your word that you would open our hearts and minds and fill us with your joy and peace. We need reformation and we need revival. So would you act, Lord, for the sake of your Son. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Well, it is a new year, and that typically means that we are busy setting personal goals and putting forth resolutions for change in and of themselves, not terrible things. Uh, I saw a funny joke the guy said on the first day, um, I I messed up already, but 2023 is going to be my year. It's day one, and you've already, okay. (laughs) But setting goals isn't inherently a bad thing, and in that same spirit, though, I'd like for us to consider yet again the state of the church. And I've done these addresses in the past, uh, but usually it's one particular message on a particular Sunday. And this year, though, I'd like to take two weeks to deal with two different but related ideas. And these two topics are interconnected and both are integral to the call Christ has placed upon his church. And also, it just so happens that they are both things that the church prays for probably more than we might assume. Furthermore, I want to be clear that I'm addressing everyone in this room and everyone else who's not in this room, the other 7 billion people. Now, the church part of the state of the church is meant to be directed at the worldwide universal church, the body of Christ all over the world. So I'm talking to everyone, especially the worldwide church. And I do realize that not everyone is going to hear this. I get that, but it's of little to no a consequence to me. One more thing, something that we do with books, I'm dedicating these messages, these two messages, and I'm dedicating them specifically to the Fauquier County pastors. Uh, some, are who, some are who most definitely apathetic about these things, others who may wholeheartedly agree, and I certainly invite them to consider this content, and I invite them to act upon the content as well. Uh, some pastors are in desperate need of repentance themselves for failing to guard Christ's flock, for failing to preach the whole counsel of God, and so on and so forth. Others simply need direction and guidance, but one thing we all need is grace, that's for sure. Now, those two concepts that I'm referencing are reformation and revival. 
Reformation and Revival. And tonight we're going to look more specifically at Reformation, and Lord willing, next week we'll consider the biblical doctrine of revival. And to be clear, what we are talking about is of grave importance. And I believe these two things are something we should be crying out to God for. However, I am assuming that you all understand that the prerequisite to this is repentance. We want Reformation and Revival, but there is a caveat. There is a prerequisite, namely repentance. Metanoia in Greek, that is repentance, is the changing of one's mind regarding one's behavior. Very simple definition. It's the changing of one's mind. Think of the word metamorphosis and that idea of change. And metanoia is the same idea. Changing of one's mind with regard to one's behavior. It involves sorrow for sin and folly, but it also involves the volition, feelings, and mind of man, all of which are resolved to turn in another direction. So when you sin, you're choosing this direction. To repent is to turn and go the other way. Presumably the other way leads us back to the holiness of God, not some other form of a respectable sin and so on. So repentance And by the way, the whole man, as we talk about the the will, the volition of man, feelings, your mind, your heart, everything turning in the other direction, the whole man must turn from sin and go headlong into grace. So reformation and revival, uh, I should say repentance and reformation, revival too, but both ask this question, who do we want to imitate? Who do we want to imitate? Who do you want to be like? That's what Reformation asks. Who do you want to be like? Is it Christ? Is it he whom your soul desires? Is it him or is it someone else? See, men will either have their image of godness restored in and by Christ, or they will seek to draft their own deity to image. That's how the whole thing works. Deep repentance is the key. Not a shallow repentance, but a deep repentance. The Psalm 51 repentance, where you are crushed before the Lord in agony because you have offended the holiness of God. That is a deep repentance. Long before we have reformation and revival, we'll need to have a healthy dose of repentance. And repentance for the laundry list of apathies and general disregard for the entirety of God's commands. So when you think of the repentance list that the church in America needs to get get on board with, obviously things like apathy for abortion is at the top. You know, apathy for injustice and and, and all the way down to the minutia of tax is taxation being theft and so on. I mean, the whole list is there, not only committing these sins, but failing to do these other requirements. That's the repentance list. But that is not to say that we cannot have a smidgen of repentance or revival either. When I say reformation, here's what I mean. I mean a rediscovery and realignment of our lives in accordance to the law word of God. When I'm saying reformation, I don't mean let's get cute and dress up like the reformers 500 years ago and throw a party and call it good. I'm fine with that. People do that on Reformation Day, also known as Halloween. So be it. But the Reformation I'm talking about, the thing that we need so desperately is a rediscovery and realignment of our lives in accordance to the law, word of God. It is always Reformation according to the Holy Bible. Reformation is always in accordance to the Holy Word of God. Now, when I say revival, I mean an utter dependence and reliance on the Holy Spirit to give us what we need for the kingdom calling that God has uh, brought us into. It is always revival according to the Holy Spirit. So when I say reformation, it's reformation, a rediscovery and realignment of our lives in accordance to the law word of God. When I say revival, I mean revival according to the Holy Spirit. Dependence upon him. He is a person. Don't ever say the Holy Spirit's an it. He is a he. He is a person. We need to speak about him appropriately. And I'm going to get into more of that next week, Lord willing. But We need to be dependent upon him and relying upon him to guide us where he would take us. Namely, repentance and faith, repentance and obedience. Now, those two things, by the way, reformation and revival, can be wrapped up inside a repentant heart. 
It's not like you ever get to the place in your life and, oh, I don't need to repent anymore. I've got it figured out. I am good to go. Everyone should just come and learn from me because I am, I'm frankly wisdom. <laughs> and now you have pride to repent of and you just lost. So good job. You're back on the re repentance train. But those two things, re re uh, reformation and revival, can exist inside a sort of like a you know, they can work together in tandem inside a heart that is repentant. Now, as you might suspect, reformation and revival go together like the Word and the Spirit go together. In fact, the inscripturated Word, as we know it, in your lap, the Holy Scriptures you possess, the inscripturated Word, as we know it, came to us because the Holy Spirit came upon men in the past. Since the scriptures are breathed out by God, Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.16, it's on the front of your bulletin, we confess, because that's true, we confess that as our ultimate authority, the Bible is inerrant and infallible. It's without error and it cannot err. Okay, so men everywhere, we're all looking in our nation right now for an infallible word. Many are looking to the CDC, many are looking to Dr. Fraudchi, many are looking in all these places for an infallible word, and all you need is a two-minute clip to show just how the narrative keeps changing, and you realize, yeah, these are fallible, uh, fallible people, and they don't know what's going on. So why not a fourth booster? That's where we're at. Everyone's looking, though. Pay attention to what they're looking for. They are looking for infallibility. They are looking for something inerrant, and we have it. And we have it. They do not. They are chasing in all the wrong places. Consequently, my main thesis tonight goes like this. Hear his word and do his will. That is reformation. Hear his word. Do his will. That is reformation. It's very simple. Hear his word. Do his will. Hear his word. Do his will. Beat that into your head for the next 365 days. And then we'll do it all again next year at the same time. Hear his word, do his will. That is reformation. Children, what is reformation? Hear. Perfect. Okay, you got it. Work on that this week, parents. Now, there is no reformation to be had until we have the word of God taking roots in our heart. It has to take root in our hearts. That's the bottom line. There is no reformation to be had until we have the word of God take root in our hearts. So, let's try to do that tonight. Let's look at our text. Back in Joshua. In Joshua 1, verse 8, well, the whole beginning of Joshua, Yahweh speaks with Joshua, who is now leading Israel after the death of Moses. Moses has died. Joshua is the guy. He's the main guy. He's going to take them across the Jordan into the promised land where they are going to go and conquer. They're going to purge the Canaanites. They're going to be victorious. They are going to take the land. They're going to subdue it in judgment against all the wicked Canaanites. They're going to end the abortion holocaust in Canaan. They're going to take care of business. And by the end of Joshua, the 12 tribes had pretty much settled in the land, though there were some more skirmishes that would take place uh, in the book of Judges. In fact, actually, Joshua, we, we, this kind of comes out in the book of Judges, and Lord willing, we're going to study that book uh, here after this series. But they didn't quite purge everyone out like they were supposed to. They still compromised. So there was still, you know, it's sort of like, I'll repent for the big sins, but the little ones, you know, they're not that big of a deal. So I'll just let them hang out in the corner of my heart. Here we are. At any rate, Yahweh gives this rejoinder to Joshua in verses 8 through 9. He says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way successful, and then you will be prosperous. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do, do not be in dread or be dismayed. For Yahweh your God is with you wherever you go. After wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, the time had come. Yahweh, we know, had rather decisively won the battle against Egypt, and God's people were plodding along through the Middle Eastern desert on their way to the Promised Land. And yet, God pauses to remind us and remind them of their most important duty, their most important responsibility. The book of the law, sometimes it's called the book of the covenant, but presumably we're talking about the Ten Commandments and the case laws of Exodus and Deuteronomy, 
which Moses had penned. Joshua would have been in possession of those documents. But that book of the law was not to depart from their mouths. Notice the language. It was not to depart from their mouths. That's another way of saying they were to talk about it incessantly, which is what the Jewish Shema, the prayer, Shema Israel, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. That's what that prayer was all about. Talk about it in the morning. Talk about it in the evening, when you're traveling, when you're going to bed. This book of the law should be everywhere you go. That's where it should go, everywhere in your home. In other words, all of life is to be integrated into this integral word. And Yahweh tells Joshua that we must be careful not to just talk about it, but we must be careful to do it. So the law, the Bible you have in your hand, is something you're supposed to do. And by the way, just reading it isn't the only part. You're supposed to do something with it. By making this connection of mind and body, covenantal blessings will accrue. A person full of scripture is a person who is set toward obedience. Yahweh also warns for us to be strong and courageous, fearing no man, only fearing God, for he is with us wherever we go. Which is all to say that all of life is to be integrated into this integral Word of God. We are not, by the way, to be shaped solely by what we see. We are not to be shaped solely by what we see, solely by what we think of on our own volition, as if God just plopped us here and left and we just have to figure all things out on our own. That's what Paul means by living by faith, not by sight. You're not supposed to let your sight drive you. Because if you do, what do you do the past two years? You panic, you fear, and then you have blood cortisol problems, and then you wonder why you get sick. This is how fear takes root in people's lives, because they're looking at what they see, and only what they see. A person full of scripture is a person who is set towards obedience. So all of life is to be integrated into the integral word of God. We're not to be shaped by what we see. We're not to be shaped by what we can do on our own. We are to be totally and utterly shaped by scripture. Now, Christianity is a scriptural religion, meaning the Bible is the Bible as the authority that it is. It moves us into greater obedience and fuller blessing. It is the illuminating word that guides our feet and our path. And that's the assumption, of course, being that we're walking. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, says Psalm 119. It's the illuminating word. It guides our feet. It guides our path. The assumption is we are walking in obedience. We're walking in faith. Now go back to 2 Kings. In the interest of time, I'm not going to read the whole passage again, but I do want to give you quickly the context of uh, chapter 22 and 23. So, <clears throat> Josiah, interestingly enough, any kids in here who are eight right now? Do we have an eight-year-old present? Are you eight, Kaysen? Kaysen, you're eight. So, Josiah was, he, he was Judah's 16th ruler at the age of eight. Josiah became a king over Israel at the age of eight. Wouldn't that be cool? I would trust you more than our current president, frankly. <laughs> But Josiah becomes Judah's 16th ruler at the age of eight. And the Bible tells us that he was a good king. He was a good king. He walked in the way of his father David, and he did not turn to the right or the left. Whenever the Bible says that, it simply means that he spent his days walking in the path of the Torah, the law. He didn't sway. And of course, Deuteronomy 28 says, if you walk to the left or the right, curses come, and God will put you back on the path. It just won't always be pretty. So in his 18th year as king, he decided, Josiah did, he decided that he would order that repairs be made to the temple. Uh, Things needed to be cleaned up a bit. And while this went on, the book of the law, sometimes called the book of the covenant, the book of the law, the book of the covenant was found. And the finding of this book, which was presumably, probably a combination of Exodus and Deuteronomy, if not the whole Pentateuch, they probably discovered, oh yeah, Moses wrote this. But it launches a religious revival throughout the land. So after learning of the discovery, Josiah 
He's curious. He wants to know what's going to happen to them because of their disobedience. It's almost as if Josiah said, oh, wait, that's right. Yahweh is God, and we've been fairly unruly, so my guess is we're probably in trouble. Huldah, the prophet, warns them that, one, the city will fall along with the people because of their sins and transgressions, and two, because Josiah repented, the disaster won't happen until after Josiah is dead. So that's all of 2 Kings 22. In chapter 23, Josiah gathers the leaders at the temple, and the book of the covenant is read aloud. They finally gave attention to the public reading of Scripture. At that time, the covenant is renewed, and the people take an oath before God and the king, and together they pledge to obey Yahweh and his covenant law. So following this act of national covenanting, by the way, something I'm in favor of, national covenanting, that's itself an act of repentance. But following that, Josiah purges the land of idolatry. Pagan objects are destroyed and burned. Pagan priests are destroyed. Talking about purging the pulpits. Along with all the pagan shrines, the altars, the pagan high places that were erected where they could worship the false gods, the Asherah and Baal and all those other false gods, they destroy it. They take them all out. They burn it. Today, that would be akin to maybe burning down the IRS. With no one in, now they're listening to this sermon, but destroying the pagan places. Now, Josiah even goes so far as to burning the bones of the dead pagan priests. They're already dead, but he, they dig them up, pull out the ossuaries, burn them. And that's a fulfillment of prophecy, actually, from 1 Kings 13. So after a complete reformation of the culture of Judah, Josiah calls the people together to celebrate the Passover. And curiously enough, God still carries out his sovereign judgment against Judah several years after Josiah's death. Just a couple more chapters in 2 Kings 25, we see the fall of Judah. Now, Josiah, we're told, will go on to lose his life as he is actually killed in a battle against Egypt by the hand of Pharaoh Necho himself. So, interesting moment in Israelite history. Repentance is deep, national covenanting, coming together and vowing to obey God and his word and so on. I want to unpack these ideas a little bit further tonight. The two texts that we looked, looked at here are both centered on a couple of things. First, repentance is one aspect of our life with God. Repentance is one aspect of our life with God. If you don't have a daily regiment of repentance, then you're doing it wrong. When we turn from idols individually, idols as a church, idols as a culture, and so on, then things begin to change. Second, Reformation can only come about with a rediscovery of the book of the law. That is, a recapturing of our biblical imagination. In other words, there is no possible way to get Reformation without first getting back to the scriptures. There is there's just not in, our, in America today, there's not going to be another radical shift in Reformation until we go back to the word of God. Repentantly go back to the word of God, we might as well say. So that, that's in our own lives Okay? in the lives of the people of God, our families, our churches, and so on. There's just never going to be a re reformation unless we go back to the scriptures. So I want to, I want to take you back his, into history a little bit. I want to go back to the, the, the Protestant Reformation 500 years ago. While humanists were having their heyday in Southern Europe, thanks to the Renaissance, Northern Europe was being transformed by a rediscovery of the authority of the Bible. The, Reforma uh, the Renaissance kicked, the, sort of the Renaissance just means like this rebirthing. Culturally kicked off in, in Italy and other places, but lots of art, lots of music, sort of a recapturing of humanist uh, thinking back, dating back to even the time of Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, and so forth. They thought that they, if they could get back to that, then we'd be good to go. Well, while that was happening and sort of going on in the north, in northern Europe, especially in Wittenberg, Germany, where Luther was stationed, and he started his, his work, a lot of things were, were changing. People up there were going back to the authority of the Word of God. Men like John Wycliffe and Jan Hus helped pave the way for men like Martin Luther and John Calvin to further reformational efforts. And I mentioned this earlier, but in his book, The Legacy of John Calvin, David Hall 
the author explains the social impact of the Reformation. And I want you to pay close attention to this because it's a fascinating um, book and a fascinating look at, at the legacy of Calvin himself. There were t- ten, 10 key areas that can be traced back to this reformational worldview. And I can't explain all 10 due to time constraints. I'm just going to have to say them and give you a quick word. You can get the book if you want to know more. And I at least want you to be thinking about them. Here are those 10 things. What did the Reformation give, give us? The first thing is education. Thanks to Calvin's Geneva and other places in Europe, of course, education became something for everyone, not just the elite of the day. Education shifted. The second thing was welfare. Welfare. The church began to meet the needs of the poor. The third thing, common law. Common law. No longer was there a divine right of kings as though they themselves and the office they occupied were deity incarnate. Think of the pharaohs, the Caesars, right? The law was to be consistent. It was to be simple. It was to be understood and made plain for everyone. We've sort of lost track of that common law today as we pile on legislation after legislation. We're all committing felonies every five minutes because we don't even know what they say. Number four, freedom of the church. Sphere sovereignty, a separation of jurisdictions between the magistrate, the church, the family. Those are, there are certain things that just belong to the family. There are certain things that belong to the individual. There are certain things that belong to the church. Number five, Republican form of government. The Senate with representation, a point that I take issue with, but that's for another time. But that was birthed out of Geneva and Calvin's ideas. Number six, decentralized political life. As Chesterton once said, this is such a great quote, he said, we, we need politicians so local that we can kick them. <laughs> I like that. Number seven, vocation or work. Everyone has a kingdom calling and all lawful vocations matter for the sake of the kingdom. There's no more clergy class where the only real meaningful job is just to be a pastor or a priest, right? No, everyone's job matters because the kingdom matters. Number eight, economics and commerce. Sometimes called the Puritan work ethic. We are to develop technology, free markets. We are to work very hard. We are to live frugal, wise lives. We are to build wealth. We should make profits. Uh, We should do business. We should grow capital. We should create employment opportunities. And frankly, we should be generously charitable. Number nine, art. Art. The Reformation gave way to using the music of the Renaissance to glorify God. Martin Luther's hymns, we sing one of them here frequently, uh, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, came from Martin Luther 500 years ago. Biblical hymns. And then later, of course, men like Handel and Bach came out and learned from the Reformation, and they were composers. Music came to the Psalter, the book of Psalms. So Suddenly people could sing in public worship and gave everyone a voice. Everyone was allowed to sing intelligently and intelligibly. You understood the language. Music was put to it. And 10 is, of course, perhaps one of the greatest aspects because of the Gutenberg press, but number 10 is media. Out of the Reformation, media happened. The free press, publishing ideas so they get out there quickly as possible, get out there as widely as possible and even efficiently as possible. So those are the 10 things that the Reformation gave us. And if you enjoy any of those things today, you can thank the Protestant Reformation for it. And of course, yet today, we do not live in a culture that recognizes the authority of the Bible. Our pastors have removed themselves from the public square, cardening off their ministries because the town square is just too messy. I mean, think about this for a minute. The priests of Josiah's day had to clean the temple out in order to discover that maybe, just maybe, the absolute sovereign God of the universe has given us propositional revelation to where we can know who he is and we can know who we are. When the pulpits aren't sure of the authority of the scriptures and when they're busy doing their religious activities, like blessing the pets while the world burns around them, maybe we have a problem. And the shocking thing about... The King Josiah story, I was reflecting on it this week. The shocking thing about this story in 2 Kings 22 and 23, it isn't the radical reform that he instituted, right? All the burning of of places, the the killing of pagan priests, 
the toppling of all these high altars that they built. It, people look at that and think, wow, that was crazy. No, that's not the shocking thing. The real kicker is the fact that the priests didn't know that they were sitting on the Word of God in the temple the entire time. I mean, that's the equivalent of churches today. Oh, let's clean out the closet. Oh, there's a Bible. What is this? Imagine a pastor forgetting he has a Bible. Imagine churches forgetting that they have a Bible. Imagine pastors who just never read their Bible. That's what we have today. They get up there with their cute little get-up, and they tell a cool story as if anyone really cares what they had for breakfast. Give people the word of God for crying out loud. Christians today largely do not understand history. They do not understand the basic principles of how a social order is developed and maintained. They do not understand what has taken place in history to even get us to this point. On top of this, they only look at what's in front of them, the immediacy of their political situation, their job situation, and so forth. When we do this, we attempt to solve problems by merely looking at a situation, not what's above the situation, not what came before it, or what can come after it, when we should instead subject ourselves to the Word of God the entire time. Friends, we are in the midst, I know this is, this is obvious, but I'll just state it, we are in the midst of a massive cultural revolution that can only be undone by a reformation of the church. One of the main reasons that we find ourselves in the disheveled mess that we do is because we have lost the audacity of declaring the authority of the Bible despite all opposition. It's like the minute we get opposition, we're scared. Oh no, they, they called me a bad word. Come to the abortion clinic. I'll take you to the college campus. You want to be called a bad word? You, you caught what I said, right? The reason we're in the mess is because we have lost the audacity of declaring the authority of the Word of God despite all opposition. Many have become cowards. They're afraid to be canceled. Afraid to be ridiculed. Too, too scared to confront sin. Where is our grit? Where is our determination? Where is our zeal to conform ourselves to the standard of God's Word? These are the questions that we should be considering. Kids, what did I say earlier? What is Reformation? Hear His Word and do His will. That is Reformation. Have we not been called to integrally walk into this Word light? Every area of life. Listen, life is religion. Life is religion. It's not one section of it. It's, it is religion. Life is religion. And true religion is a single-hearted devotion and service to the living God as we carry out our tasks as His vice regents. And here's how it plays out. This is a great way to remember Jesus being a prophet, priest, and king. Well, Adam and Eve were called prophet, priest, and king, and they had responsibilities, and they failed. But Jesus gives it back to us. It's ours. So here we go. As priests, what should we be doing? We are to bring healing and peace to the world. That's half the reason Health for All of Life was written. We are to bring health and peace to the world. As kings... We are to cultivate the dominion mandate, administering our affairs and ordering our lives in accordance to his will. That's what kings do. And as prophets, the all-encompassing, life-sustaining law of God is our standard to which we conform our lives and by which we proclaim the holiness of God. This is reformation. If we can get those three things down, we can see reformation. And I get it. It's crazy out there. Senators being shut down on Twitter for spreading mis misinformation. <laughs> the world is systematically giving itself to the utter denial of God in all things. You cannot be God if there is a God already. The great problem today is one of synthesis, accommodating pagan presuppositions and conclusions by melding them together with the revelation word we have in Scripture. Oh, I call it an a la carte Christianity. Take and choose what you like from it. We have had the Bible this whole time, friends. We've had the Bible this whole time, but it's been shelved away, and we have forgotten all that, it, all that it demands. And listen, there is no reformation in the world without a reformation in the hearts of men. 
And there is no reformation in the hearts of men without a recapturing of the Holy Scriptures. If you do not, listen, if you do not have a longing for the Word, you are part of the problem. If you do not have a longing to reframe and reintegrate every aspect of your life, your thoughts, your words, your deeds, in conformity to the Word of God, then you are part of the reason we do not have reformation in the world. I adjure you to get in the Word this year more than you ever have in your life. Desperate, it's it's come to this. We have to go back to the Word. (laughs) The Word of God given to us by the Holy Spirit is an integral power. That is, it brings together all of life. It binds it up and grants us the faith necessary to believe the Word and build our lives on the Word. The Word destroys our double-mindedness. It puts to rest our divided hearts. It slays our people-pleasing attitudes. It destroys our pride. It clears all of the mess. It's powerful enough to take every single thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Every thought, every opinion from the CDC, from the government, you name it, it can take it captive. If only we would yield to the Spirit and the Word. The Word is the illuminating, driving, and directing principle of the Holy Spirit for our lives. And (laughs) the Word of God prompts our an active obedience, by the way, not a passive retreatism. There is no like, I love the Word and I'm scared to do anything with it. That's not a category. What have we heaped upon the word? That's a question I want to ask. What have we heaped upon the word? Well, we've heaped pietism on the word, right? Our piety is the only thing that matters. Subjectivism. We've heaped subjectivism on the word. How I feel becomes supreme. What I think matters becomes supreme. What about mysticism, right? If only we could channel the divine spark in all of us. I was recently invited to be on Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s Spiritual Advisory Committee with the children's health defense. And I did a video and uh, it was interesting because the conversation was, is like, this is an interfaith thing. You know, how do we do that? And there was one other Protestant pastor there. Well, I think there were a few, but one other one, he was an Anglican minister. And he, and he said, well, it depends on what we're doing. I kind of reiterated that too. Um, I'm not going to go and do a worship service and pretend we're all praying to the same God. If you want to fight COVID tyranny, I'm there with you. But if you want to me like conflate our religious convictions together and act like Jesus isn't exclusive and that Allah is actually real and all this other nonsense, I can't do it. But that's kind of the balance we're up against right now because we're crying out to the one true living God, not the false gods who got us in this mess. That's the mysticism of today. We've heaped relativism on the Bible. Sure, the Bible has some things that are true. It's, it's true in some places. We can trust it for some things. Or dualism. What happens out there in the world is irrelevant to my spirituality. I'm walking with Jesus. Me and Jesus are going to have a great year. Sure you are. See, we trifle with God by minimizing our sins, by lowering His standards, by trying to do things on our own volition. We want change in the world, but we don't want to change ourselves. We want liberty, but we farm out our security. We want freedom, but we leave it to the state to grant it. We remove the organ and demand the function, as C.S. Lewis once said. Secularism and statism happens. Listen, it's simply man doing for himself what the Word of God should be doing for him. Which again means that we need to be repentant. We need to be praying for a deep repentance, not a shallow repentance. Oh, I'm sorry, Lord. No, a on-your-face crying out to God repentance. And in our prayers, we ought to be praying for the kingdom of God to come on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus told us to do that. Are you doing that? Christ has established his promised kingdom already, but we are asking for it to come more and more. And how do we know when it comes? Well, the kingdom of God is present where things are right ordered and true with respect to the law word of God. And I believe that the next reformation is going to be, it's going to have to deal with three things, more things, but these are kind of the main three I thought were necessary. I believe the next reformation is one going to have to be a recovery of the family as we stop fueling the nanny state. We're going to have to rethink how we do family. 
and not this jaded, atomistic, send the kids off away to school so they can do their own thing while we just get to sit home and drink wine. You've seen the first day of school videos. It's a shame. Get the kids out. Can't wait for them to get out. Da-da-da-da-da. Yeah, you're contributing to the problem. So we're going to see re repentance. Parents are going to stop sending their kids to public school. That's going to go away eventually. So we need, a, we need the family. Second thing, we need a Holy Spirit-fueled and a Holy Spirit-filled revival that submits to the authority of Christ now, based on his claims now, which is essentially post-millennial fervor and optimism. So that's going to be there. And third, the next Reformation is going to be a complete reevaluation of our current theology of the state. It's going to have to unshackle itself from the problems of centralized bureaucracy and collectivism and it will reject the Enlightenment's humanist underpinnings, which elevates the rationalism of man over against the inspired revelation of God in the Holy Scriptures. We're going to have to see a, re a theocratic judiciary take place, more local. I love Chesterton, that quote. We need local politicians so that we can kick them when they get out of hand. Local judges handling and reacting to disputes. A disavowing of preemptive and active executive power. It's gonna, we're going to get sick of this nonsense that we've seen for two years. And part of the reevaluation in the next, re re uh, next Reformation is going to be no more executive power. You can't be trusted. The church will finally apply all of Scripture to all of life, and we will finally be fed up with the baptized paganism in the civil sphere. This pandemic and everything left in its wake in the years to come is going to drive us there. It will. The next Reformation will come, but it will come when we are done yoking ourselves to the state. It will come when we take seriously the call to obedience in every area of life. It will come when we were finally done crying out to everyone and everything but the true and living God. And it will come when we stop trifling with God's family. Reformation will come when repentance goes deep into our bones. So toil edge. That is, take up and read. Read your Bible, believe your Bible, and dare to apply your Bible to every area of life. There is no Reformation without it. Kids, tell me what Reformation is again. Hear, hear his word, and do his will. Hear his word, do his will. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We are grateful that you have revealed yourself to us, that we can know you, we can know who we are. Lord, and I ask and pray that you would give us a clear understanding of it. Help us to know what it means, what it says. Help us to digest it and ruminate on it so that we can know how to obey you, to hear your word and to do your will. Father, we are in desperate, desperate need. We are in dire straits and we cry out to you. We cry out to you, Father. May we experience your spirit afresh, Lord, and may we be challenged. Father, would you spark a movement here in our county in this state and in this nation, Lord, so that the world can be changed and, 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 and moved into greater obedience. So, Father, as we take communion together, as we sing, as we gather for food afterwards, we ask for your blessing now. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.